My parents always say, Corey, never play poker while you're intoxicated. So today we're doing just that. Here's the plan. I'm gonna play one, two, two, five, and five, ten, and see if we can actually win money while our frontal cortex is in shambles. Ugh. All right, we have our baby. We have our keys. Now the only thing left is to get my body over to Seabrook in one piece. I haven't played poker in what feels like a calendar month. There's no 2-5 games running, dude. The game of poker in New Hampshire is toast. PLO is taking over poker in the state of New Hampshire. If you don't know PLO, it's Pot Limit Omaha, which is basically bingo for degenerates. If you don't know what it is, keep it that way. All of the crazy action players are like, yo, my dog, two cards is cool, why don't we double it? All of the No Limit Hold'em games are being fucked by Pot Limit Omaha. All of like the action players are just moving from Hold'em to Omaha and it's completely eradicated 2-5 as a whole. Comrade, fear no longer though. Seabrook runs a crazy high hand promotional, which is like $1,000 every hour. And that makes all of the degenerates scurry in like mice that get a whiff of Swiss cheese. On days like today, we are gonna drive over to Seabrook and pray to God that the 2-5 table doesn't close by the time I get there. Okay, horrible news. We're still 20 minutes away and the second table just broke. There's one table and no list. And I'm still on my way. This, the, 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 ta the game might actually break before I even get there and it's 5 p.m. I'm in shambles. All right, thank God the game is still going. I, I There was a, probably like a 30% probability of this bitch break. It feels like it's 96 degrees, probably only about 60, but I'm gonna remove this before I die of heat exhaustion. All right, let's go inside before this game decides to break. Dude, I need a haircut. I have no idea what's going on with my hair. All right, starting off in the one, two streets while we wait for a two, five seat. Psych bitch! Didn't play a single relevant hand. After 15 or 20 minutes, we get moved to the two, five seat and we actually get involved immediately. Early on in the night, we looked down at nine, eight of spades. I opened to $35 and only the straddler makes the call. Heads up to a big ass nothing burger. He checks, I bet, he calls. Turns the four of diamonds, he checks, and this is poker, not football, let's not punt. Going off to see one last card, which peels off the king of hearts. The straddler checks it to me a third time. I can't imagine a world in which I win this pot if I check back. For these reasons, kind of inclined to bet. We unblock clubs, which missed, and you could easily have a six, even pocket fives, pocket sevens, pocket eights. All of these hands are going to be miserable when facing a bet. I toss out $75, hoping to generate a bunch of auto folds, but instead I get snap called by ace king of clubs. What the f***? That is literally criminal to do what he just did. Don't flat call ace king preflop. Just put more money in, dude. Five minutes has passed and I'm already ordering my first alcoholic beverage of the night. We are in for a long one. Then we look down at ace seven of diamonds in the cutoff. I opened $35 and only the button makes the call. Heads up to a flop of 10, 8, 7 with one diamond. Our hand is very virgin-esque, but it can develop into a chad on later streets. I can easily check call, whereas betting and facing a raise would be miserable. For this reason, I tap the table. The button thinks that's a great idea, as he checks it right back. Got off to a turn card, which peels off the four of spades. Shouldn't really change much, aside from bringing in a backdoor flush draw on a hand like 6-5, Seems like a brick otherwise. Nah, it seems pretty thin to go for value here. So once again, I check. This time, however, the button throws out $50. We're still beating all of his random garbage, so I flick in the call. Going off to see one last card, which, my God, it's deja vu. I don't think we're getting value from anything worse. When that's the case, tapping the table, praying to God it goes check, check. The button says... All right, buddy, I give it up. He checks back. I flip it over, and he shows ace-queen offsuit. 
I can't believe I'm not getting three bet pre-flop by these. Listen, dude, I wait like six hours to look down at two face cards. Could never be me. I'd be all in at some point. I don't know. A few orbits later, we looked down at Ace-10 offsuit in the low jack. I opened at $35. The hijack calls, and we go heads up to a flop of 10-5-3 rainbow. Beautiful board texture for moi. I place a bet, and the hijack makes the call. Going off to a turn card, which peels off the queen of clubs. Now I think we have a decision to continue betting for value or slowing down to pot control. I think this guy's going to have a lot of middling stuff, and I still expect to have the best hand a majority of the time. It's just a question of whether or not he'll call. This guy's probably like eight years away from getting the elderly discount at Chili's, so he's probably not calling that light. When that's the case, I think checking turn and value betting river is best. On the flip side, I'm going to have so many bluffs that continue barreling on this queen, so I really think you can go either way. In this case, my cerebral cortex said, dude, we're like 16 years old. No way he's folding. $90. The hijack said, psych, bitch, I'm out. I was like, damn it. Buckle up, buttercup. This hand is an absolute doozy. We looked down at pocket sevens in the big blind. The low jack limps, and the button kicks it up to $40. I stick in the call, and the low jack comes along as well. Going three ways to a flop of three, three, deuce, rainbow. Action quickly checks the button, who slides out a c-bet of $50. I think the standard play is to call. The issue with that is there's going to be a lot of turn cards that we don't like, and I think the button can be doing this with a variety of over cards. Our hand, specifically, could use a lot of protection. For these reasons, I decided check raise to $150. The low jack gets out of the way, but the button decides to make the call. Going off to a turn card, which peels off the five of diamonds. This is a great card. Uh, not only is it a card under our pair, but we are still ahead of all of his random over cards. Like I mentioned on the flop, I got this tingling sensation in my ball sack that this guy had over cards. It's going to be pretty tough to call when you have 10 high. What I'm trying to say is I think there's more value in checking and allowing him to bluff than there is in betting. For this reason, I decide to slow down and check. The button has different ideas as he throws out a bet of $185. Well, I didn't play it this way to check fold, so I stick in the chips, and we go off to see one last card which peels off the three of diamonds. I check it over to him once more. Even though we have a full house, in theory, believe it or not, we're praying to the Lord Heavenly Father this goes check check. If the button bets this river, he's very polarized. He's repping a very strong hand or nothing at all. When you're polarized, the only size that makes sense is all freaking in. The button is around $900 behind, and as time goes on, I'm kind of getting the feeling that it's all going in the middle. He could still easily have jacks pluses played, and the unfortunate part about that for me is I'm heavily capped. Sevens is one of the best hands that I'll ever arrive at this river with. Think about it. If I had 10s plus, I'd 3-bet preflop. I'd even 3-bet 9s at some frequency. So pocket 8s and 7s are the next best thing. Sure, I could have quads or pocket 5s, pocket 2s, but we're pretty high up there. All of this is going through my head while the button is thinking about his decision. And considering this is one of the best hands that I'll ever have here in this dynamic, I'm, I'm just going to close my eyes and stick in the chips. I don't give a fuck. Do what you got to do, dude. Here's, here's what happened in real time. So yeah, um, I'm really glad that it worked out this time, but he could have very easily had pocket rockets and blasted my ass to the moon. We'll take it though. Around this time, I had a celebratory burger and fries, and while I was eating, the game broke, and I was like, no! I still wanted to play, so I cashed out and kept $300 to go play at 1-2. Now, let me explain the situation. There were two tables with an open seat. This table had a dealer, as you would expect. This table, though, woohoo! You know what I'm saying? So, in my head, I want to go to table two, so I go up to the floor guy. Hey, how's it going, man? Can I, can I go play one, two? 
He said, yeah, sure. Why don't you go to uh, table one? I was like, um, perhaps two? He said, um, sure. I was like, yeah. <laughs> we decide to rip another Tito's and sit down with our girlfriend. She just doesn't know it yet, though. We pick up Ace Jack offsuit in the cutoff. Straddle on. I raise it up to $20. The big blind and straddler make the call. Three ways to a flop of Ace, Eight, Deuce with two diamonds. The big blind just open rips it for $80. Under the gun gets out of the way, and listen, I'm two Tito's deep with a big ego in front of my girlfriend. I'm fucking calling. What do you got, brother? He immediately flips over a set. Yikes. Um, okay, that's probably gonna win the hand. Not a single worry, though, as the turn is another diamond, and the river is another diamond. So we win with a flush. Good old back door. He was like a 99% favorite to win that hand, but that is what the power of love can do. We pick up ace-king offsuit. Someone limps. There's a raise to 10, two callers, and that's just not gonna stand. I bumped that bitch up to $60. Everyone folds except the big blind, who goes all in for less. So right off the bat, we're going off to a run out. The big blind has ace nine, and he flops a nine. The rest is history. Chip him the pot. Next, we pick up nine eight of clubs in the big blind. The hijack limps, and the cutoff raises it up to $12. The small blind calls, and I flick in the chips as well. The hijack tags along, so four of us to a flop. Jack 10-4 with two spades and a diamond. Action checks to the cutoff, who throws in $20. Then the small blind check jams $75. Well, I actually don't hate the idea of folding, because if I call and the cutoff rips it, I'm going to be in shambles. It also kind of sucks that we don't have backdoor clubs or a front door flush draw. I don't know. At the end of the day, I am an ape. I see four to a straight. I'm putting the money in the middle. Would also be doing this with sets and two pairs and all that sort of stuff. Think about it. The, the small blind check raised, and I'm cold calling. That's going to look very strong from the cutoff's perspective. So uh, even if the cutoff has aces or kings, he's probably going to proceed with some caution. As expected, the cutoff makes the call as well. Going off to a turn card with a dry side pot, heads up against the cutoff with plenty of dollar bills left to play for. The turn card, no problem. Miracle seven. Holy mother of God. This is where it's kind of interesting. Like I said, there's a dry side pot, meaning I, there's really no reason to bluff. Because even if the cutoff folds, I still have to beat the player who's all in. So there's no point. For this reason, I decide to slide out $50. I could do this with a lot of draws too. The cutoff might perceive this as weakness, like I'm trying to buy a cheap river. If he rips it in my mouth, that would be very, uh, that's a really weird way to say that, but he doesn't end up jamming. Instead, he makes the call. Going off to see one last card, praying to God to see a brick. No, the nine of spades. Yeah. The front door flush draw gets there, brings in a one liner. That's legitimately the worst card in the deck. In theory, this is a 100% check. No question about it. What am I going to do? I'm going to bet. Let me explain why. This player had been limping all of his suited connectors and ace X suited hands. Considering he raised pre-flop, I think he's heavily weighted towards sets or over pairs like jacks, tens, aces, kings, queens. All of these holdings are going to try to snap check back this river. I don't think he has many flushes or straights as played. He raised pre-flop. That's a huge indicator. This is so player-specific. Like I said, in theory, there's a snap check back. If you do anything else, you suck at the game and need to quit. However, I'm a bloodthirsty hound trying to extract every last damn dollar that I possibly can. We're going for value. In terms of sizing, I only have around $200 behind, but this is quite the ugly board. So if I go all in, I think aces and kings can get away. I slide out $100. Giving him a great price, throwing the fishing rod. Come on, buddy. Reel in. You can't fold. Sure enough, the cutoff flicks in the call. I flip over my cards. The small blind shows pocket kings, and the cutoff mucks. Now we look down at ace-queen offsuit in the big blind. Straddles on. The button limps. 
I kick it up to $25 and only the straddler makes the call. Heads up to a flop of 7-3 deuce all diamonds. I have a flush draw and showdown value. We're beating all of his random overcards. I start with a check. The straddler does not. Instead, sliding out a hefty bet of $40. We have a queen high flush draw, so I'm not going anywhere just yet. Going off to a turn card, which peels off the four of spades. This actually gives us more outs. Now we have a gut shot. Any five will give us the wheel. Once again, I'm going to play in a flow. I check. This time, the straddler slides out a bet of $75. I don't think we're getting direct odds to call. Um, we most definitely are. We have a f ton of equity. During this session, I completely blanked that aces and queens are both probably live. That's six outs that I didn't account for. Considering we're getting direct odds to call, I think calling is the best option. I didn't think I had direct odds, so I ripped it in the guy's mouth. Really hoping to generate folds from middling pairs. Could obviously do this with a slow played flush, a set, or, you know, just ace high in a dream. After around a minute, the straddler decides <clears throat> to let it go. Not really happy with how I play this one, but it's 1-2. I'm kind of tipsy. Get off my dick. We look down at royalty and despair once more. I open to $20. The hijack, small blind, and big blind all make the call. Four ways to a flop of ace, queen, five, rainbow. Action checks to me. I actually considered checking because I think it's going to be tough to get three streets of value from a weaker ace, and there's not really that many draws available aside from gut shots. However, I decide against it. I toss out $30. The hijack calls, but both the blinds get out of the way. Got off to a turn card, which peels off the seven of spades. There's only around 250 effective behind, so I'm just going to bet and jam it all in on the river. However, it doesn't even come to that because I throw out $50 and the hijack snap jams all in. This feels horrible, but I am four Tito's Lemonades deep and I have big slick. See you on the river, dude. The hijack turns over ace queen of spades. We're gonna need a miracle two outer on the river, and unfortunately, it doesn't come. So just like that, all of our chips are going in the other direction. I sobered up, and after a few hours, I went to go play 5, 10, 20. But I was exhausted by that point, so I didn't play that long. But on the day, I ended up winning 1.7. I guess it's safe to assume that alcohol and poker are a great mix. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one. I need to go take a shower. I feel disgusting. I just did a 30-minute workout, so I'm going to go take a shower. But you guys need to get out of here. Toodaloo.